everyone. We are now in week six and we are covering chapter five this week. Uh, chapter five is all about thermochemistry, kind of an introduction to thermodynamics and chemistry. There's only three sections, but the material is fairly dense and heavy. So make sure you take your time going through it and you come to me with any questions you may have. So 5.1 is on energy basics, and then we're going to build on that in 5.2 calorimetry and build on everything even more with 5.3 enthalpy. So just a kind of example of some thermochemistry, sliding a match head along a rough surface that makes a combustion reaction that gives us energy in the form of heat and light. And that's really all we're gonna be talking about is energy in this chapter and how energy can transfer from one form to another or from one place to another. So chemical changes are all over. You know, we see it when we're eating, when your food is metabolized, there's chemical reactions that your body undergoes to metabolize that food. Burning fossil fuels, what we need for our cars. Um, and even just making products from raw materials. All these are some examples of chemical changes. And these are just a couple examples. Thermochemistry now is the study of the heat that is either absorbed or released during chemical and physical changes. So we're going to look into what thermochemistry is and the different calculations we can perform around it. So these are just some visual examples from the three we just talked about. Um, eating food, like a cheeseburger, gives you energy to help get through your day. Um, that burger looks good except for the whole raw onions things to me. Ew. Give me cooked onions. Don't give me raw onions. Uh, go ahead. Going through traffic. Okay, part B. Picture B. The combustion of gasoline lets us move our car. Even though sometimes in traffic it doesn't feel like we're moving, that combustion keeps our car running. And C, this is coke, which is processed from coal. It's a form of coal, which helps us give energy um, to convert iron ore to iron. So for things that we use in everyday life. So let's first talk about what energy is. And energy is the capacity to supply heat or do work. Okay, so work, work is the process of causing matter to move against an opposing force. Okay, so if you're push, pushing something, you're doing work on it. Okay, um, Another example is the internal combustion engine. When those little combustion reactions are happening in your car, uh, it's it makes gas, which then pushes against the pistons in the engine, causing it to then move. Now there are two main types of energy. Potential energy, and this is the energy an object has because of its position, its composition, or its condition. So it's the potential for it to do work. Um, an example is if you have a waterfall, the water that's at the top of it has the potential to fall down and be converted to kinetic energy, which is the energy an object possesses because it's moving. Okay. So these are our two main types of energy. Again, here's some a couple pictures. Um, in picture A is Victoria Falls. So this up at the very top is very high potential energy. Okay, this water has the potential to start moving. As it starts flowing down, that potential energy starts going down, but it's being converted to kinetic energy. It's moving faster and faster as it goes down. Okay, another example on B is Hoover Dam. Okay, so the water in Hoover Dam goes through generators that are towards the bottom of the dam and converts 
all it goes from potential energy at the top mo starts moving as kinetic energy and then is con con um, converted into electrical energy for power um, if you've ever been to Hoover Dam, it's, if you've never been there, it's pretty spectacular. There's some great views and whatnot, too, of the lake. Um, I don't think they're doing them right now with COVID, but um, they do uh, actual tours of the dam where you get to go down a, an elevator all the way down into the bottom, and you get to see a bit of the inner workings. So we've talked about the law of conservation of matter or, the con or conservation of mass. We also have the law of conservation of energy, okay? So during a chemical or a physical change, energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but it can change forms. So just like matter and mass cannot be created or destroyed, energy can also not be created or destroyed. Okay, sometimes it might be converted into heat. Okay, there's usually some type of conversion of one form of energy into another when you have some sort of reaction happening. So an example is thermal energy, and this is a type of kinetic energy. So thermal, think of that term thermal, what you think that means. And this has to do with kinetic energy associated with the random motion, which gives us temperature. Okay, so the temperature of something, we use that to say if something's hot or cold. The faster the molecules are moving, the higher its thermal energy, the hotter it is. Slower moving molecules have lower thermal energy and are cold. Notice these terms are in quotation marks because they're relative terms, right? Hot to me may not be, physically hot to me may not be physically hot to someone else. So some example of a hot liquid versus cold liquid, the little lines around, around each, the molecules uh, represent movement. So in this hot liquid, you can see there's a lot of movement going on, whereas in the cold liquid, not as much. So the cold liquid is gonna have that lower temperature, whereas the hot liquid is going to have a higher temperature. And thermal energy is also used for things like thermometers in that some things can expand as, uh, as the molecules move faster, they tend to want to expand when heated or contract when cooled. So this is how thermometers work, um, either mercury, which is pretty much never used anymore, or an alcohol thermometer. Okay, um, I do get questions, well, how come if it's alcohol, it's red? It's just because it's dyed red, so you can see it. Okay, so the expansion and cooling of the alcohol and the thermometer is calibrated to correspond with specific temperatures in either Fahrenheit or Celsius or Kelvin, whatever it is. We also have these bimetallic thermometers that will that are made of uh, brass and steel, and as they cool or heat up, they can expand or contract, um, corresponding with various temperatures. So let's talk about heat. So heat is not temperature. And I think that's kind of an important thing to remember. At least in the chemistry world, heat and temperature are not the same thing. Heat is the transfer of thermal energy between two bodies at different temperatures. And we abbreviate heat with a lowercase q. Okay, so we can transfer heat from one thing to another. Um, heat flow, it's redundant, but we often say, say that, because um, basically what's happening is heat flows from hot to cold, or high heat to low heat. So if you've got some bar here and you have a flame on one end, that heat energy, that heat flow, is going to start at the 
closest side and it's going to flow to the cold side. Okay, so the left side is decreasing in its thermal energy, but the cold side is increasing in thermal energy. So if you have two items and you put them together, okay, that have a difference in temperature or difference in heat, the, en the energy flows from high temperature to low temperature, and it's going to continue to flow until both substances are at the same temperature. So if you have, like, let's say you wanna make iced tea, but you, first you have to brew the tea and it needs to be hot. So then you go and you toss some ice cubes into your pitcher of tea those ice cubes are melting, right? So a lot of times uh, you may think that it's the ice cubes that are giving their cold to the tea, but in reality what's happening is the heat from the tea is being transferred to the ice cubes, causing them to melt because it's raising their heat. But then the tea, since it's giving away its heat, is going down in temperature until eventually you reach the same temperature. So here's a little picture, um, starting with the different temperature molecules we saw before, putting them together with contact. The hotter ones are going to give some of their thermal energy to the colder ones until everything is at the same temperature. And they have the same average kinetic energy. So that's the other thing, is they're also now moving at about the same pace. So when it comes to matter go undergoing chemical or physical changes, uh, we deal with the release or the absorption of heat. If this change, and this doesn't have to be a chemical change, it can also be a physical change, maybe going from a st changing states of matter. Um, if it releases heat, it is called an exothermic process, exo meaning out. Okay, so heat comes off of your system. If your system absorbs heat, you have an endothermic process. Okay, endo meaning in. So again, in the exothermic process, if you had a beaker that is, an, that is has some kind of reaction and it feels hot, it gets hotter, this is exothermic. Whereas if you have your beaker with a reaction and it gets cold, this is an endothermic reaction. So some examples uh, of an exothermic reaction would be, you know, lighting something on fire, um, using an oxyacetylene torch, lighting a grill, um, or instant hot packs. Okay. We'll talk more about those a little later. An example of something that absorbs heat for an endothermic process are instant cold packs. So you hurt yourself and a lot of times first aid kits have these cold packs where you break open, like you have to bend it to hear a snap and then it gets cold. That's an endothermic process. It's getting cold, it's absorbing heat. And he just here's a couple pictures. Um, these instant cold packs, what they generally are uh, made of is on the outside they have some ammonium nitrate powder. And then they have this inner bag of water. So when you hear that snap, what's happening is you're breaking that inner bag. And then if you shake it and whatnot, what's happening is the ammonium nitrate is dissolving in the water. And that is an endothermic process. And so because of that, it's absorbing energy and it's getting cold. So we have a few different units for measuring heat. Historically, it was measured in calories with a lowercase cal. Okay, and I'll talk about why I'm stressing the lowercase part in a second. And what the calorie is, it's the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. When you see calorie written with a capital C and then abbreviated with a capital C or capital C-A-L, 
These are used, what are used for food. This is also a kilocalorie or kcal. So on American food nutrition facts boxes, they usually have capital C-A-L for calories. But if you were to look at one from Europe, they actually usually say kcals. And kcal is, in my opinion, a little less confusing than a capital C calorie uh, because you can tell that it means a kilocalorie. The calories are very, very small. Now the SI unit of heat and work and energy is the joule. Okay, and a joule, we abbreviate it with a capital J, is the amount of energy used when a force of one newton moves an object one meter, named in honor of the physicist James Prescott Joule. And one, joule, one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. And this is actually an exact number. So if you're looking at this for sig figs, it's exact. Back really quick. Um, so the units of joules, so we just use a J for joules. That's really all we're concerned about here. But for those of you that are um, somewhat curious, the joule units are kilogram meter squared per second squared also called a newton meter because kilogram meters per second squared is equal to a newton that's all physics stuff we're not really concerned with that but just for those of you that are our that are uh, curious really weird units Now, let's talk some more terms. The heat capacity with a capital C of a piece of matter is the quantity of heat, Q, okay, so the, the heat we've been talking about, that's released when it experiences some change in temperature. We call this delta T of one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. This is an extensive property. So that means it depends on things like your size, uh, the temp, the actual temperature change, etc. Okay, or the amount of whatever it is you're looking at. Um, and so, for example, a large cast iron pan is going to have a greater heat capacity than a small cast iron pan, even though they're made of the same material. Oops, let me go back. So for instance, if we want to do calculate the heat capacity of the small cast iron pan, uh, we, we observed, this is just kind of given to us, that takes 18,150 joules to raise the temperature, a delta T of 50.0 degrees Celsius. So it has a heat capacity of 363 joules per degree Celsius. See, small. The larger pan takes 90,700 joules to raise its temperature 50 degrees Celsius. So that's the same temperature change. And so that comes out to a heat capacity of 1,814 joules per degree Celsius. So a big difference there. Okay. Uh, and this. You can see this too if you're in your kitchen and you're cooking and the amount of time it takes for a small pan to heat up versus a large pan. The small pan doesn't take as long because you don't have as much surface area and as much size to heat up. Don't try this by sticking your finger in a hot pan. Okay, so now we have specific heat capacity also known as specific heat, okay, abbreviated with a little c. And this is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. Now this guy is an intensive property. 
It only depends on the identity of the substance, not the amount. So it doesn't matter how much of something you have, it is going to have the same heat capacity, specific heat capacity. So for instance, our two cast iron pans have the same specific heat. They don't have the same heat capacity, but they have the same specific heat. So for example, Let's say we want to calculate the specific heat of the small pan. And the Q was 18,140 joules. And that pan weighs 808 grams and 50 degrees Celsius for our change in temperature. This comes out to 0 0.449 joules per gram degree Celsius. The specific heat capacity or specific heat for our large pan, whoops, We had 90,700 joules, and it weighs 4,040 grams. Delta T is 50 degrees Celsius again. And again, we see specific heat of 0 0.449 joules per gram degree Celsius. Same value. So they have the same specific heat capacity. Um, so this is specific heat capacity. Sometimes you can also see molar heat capacity. Okay, um, and molar heat capacity is, has units of joules per mole degree Celsius. Okay, whereas specific heat capacity is joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, so you can see very similar and they are both intensive properties. So here's those two cast iron pans on heating plates. They have the same specific heat because they're made of the same material. So here's a nice table of some specific heats of different substances at 25 degrees Celsius and one bar. I highly recommend, this is on page 239. This is a good page to uh, put a little mark, uh, bookmark in um, to have a reference uh, for potential homework problems or if you're doing some practice problems because sometimes you're not you're told what the substance is, so then you need to go to a chart to look up its specific heat depending on what you're calculating. Okay, um, the higher the specific heat, the better the insulator, because that means it takes more energy to raise the temperature just one degree. Okay, so you can see helium here has a pretty high specific heat, whereas something like lead has a very low specific heat. Um, this is also why, okay, aluminum, somewhat low. Um, this is why, like, aluminum, for instance, is used in cooking. Because it can transfer, it can raise its temperature hot, high very quickly, and then it can transfer that heat to your food fairly quickly. Um, and then if you look at water, water has a very high specific heat, especially compared to all this. And this is where something like climate change, why it's such a major problem that the temperature in our oceans has gone up even by just half a degree. Because it takes a lot of energy just to raise one gram of water one degree. And if we're able to, if we were raising the temperatures of our oceans by just a little bit, that is a whole crap ton of energy going into, coming from our system, from our earth from what we produce and going into that water to raise the temperature. So that's one of the reasons it's such a major problem for the water to only go up such a small amount. Okay, so let's start looking at some calculations. We can figure out the amount of heat entering or leaving a substance and it's given by the specific heat times the mass times the change in temperature, where the change in temperature is your final minus initial. Now, your book writes it this way, 
what I'm used to and most people are used to is MC delta T. It doesn't matter. Okay, it's the same thing. Um, my past students would call it the MCAT. <laughs> so I, for my pre-med people, you have to take the MCAT later. That's just how they remembered it. I didn't require them to memorize formulas. It just, they liked saying that. So if your substance is gaining thermal energy, meaning it's going up in temperature, you have a positive value of Q. If it's losing thermal energy, so it's going down in temperature, then it has a negative Q, a negative heat. So if we're given a flask with eight times 10 to the second gram of water, and we heat it up and the temperature increases from 21 to 85 degrees Celsius, how much heat did we absorb? Okay, so we have Q equals MC delta T. So we could start by just kind of writing what we know. The specific heat of water, we have to go and look at our little table. And this is liquid water, or just since we we're just told water. And so it has a specific heat of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. We're given a mass of 8.0 times 10 to the second grams. And then our delta T is equal to our final temperature, 85 degrees Celsius minus 21 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we have a 64 degrees Celsius delta T. Okay, so when you plug all that in, um, you can see your units canceling. I'm just gonna rewrite it so you can see a little better. Q equals MC delta T. One eight four joules M degrees Celsius. Four degrees Celsius. So you can see the grams here cancel and degrees cancel. We're left with joules. And the answer is 2.1 times 10 to the fifth joules. Now, we can also see that Q is positive. Okay, so heat is absorbed. Oh, you know, let me go to a blank screen here on this. Nope. Blank okay. screen time. Let's look at another example. And in this one, instead of looking for Q, we're going to look for something else. So we're told an unknown metal weighs 348 grams. And it absorbs 6.64 kilojoules of heat. So since it's absorbing kilojoules of heat, that's our Q, 6.64 kilojoules. Now we pro probably wanna just automatically transfer this to joules since specific heat has the units of joules. So there's 1,000 joules for every one kilojoule, okay, because K is kilo. So we have 6,640 six, six joules. And we're told our temperature increases from, so our initial temperature is 22.4 degrees Celsius. Our final temperature, it tells us, is 43.6 degrees Celsius. So our delta T is 43.6 degrees Celsius minus 22.4 degrees Celsius. And that's 21.2 degrees Celsius. So now we want to figure out C. Okay, so if we have our equation of Q equals MC delta T, we have Q, we have M, we have delta T, we do not have C. So let's go ahead and solve for C. Get it by itself, we need to divide both sides by M delta T. 
And we get that our specific heat is equal to Q over M delta T. And now we can plug and chug 6,640 joules divided by 348 grams times 21.2 degrees Celsius. This comes out to 0 0.900 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then if we go back to table 5.1, we can look and see what that seems to match up with. And we can't say for sure, but we can say that the specific heat of aluminum, according to that table, is 0 0.897, whoops, that's a seven, joules per gram degree Celsius, and that looks pretty close. So metal could very much be aluminum. So this is also a way you can use specific heat to identify what an unknown is. Um, for those of you, I mean, we're pretty close to it here in Barstow. Going towards a state line at, right before Prim, there's actually a huge um, solar plant. Uh, actually, I remember when they were first kind of building it, my parents and I were on our way to Vegas, and we were like, what is that? And we actually got up the freeway and went and looked, and that was a solar plant. That's pretty cool. 4,000 acres of land in the Mojave Desert. So you can see this just going straight up the 15 towards Prim. It's massive. It's really cool.